Hey everybody, Melissa here. So if you've ever had to extract data from a large data set in LibreOffice Calc, you may have used functions, formulas, or even a VLOOKUP. Well, today I'm going to show you an easier way to extract that data by using a pivot table. Now, if you've never used a pivot table, they can seem a little bit complicated and overwhelming, but I'm going to make it easier by breaking down the setup, the structure, how to use charts, and how to make changes. So the next time you need to extract data, it will be quick, easy, and accurate. I cannot wait to show you how this works, so let's go ahead and get started. This is a spreadsheet that has annual sales data from 2022. Now it's a pretty large data set with around 200 rows of data. And what we're going to do is extract some of this data using a pivot table. Now to insert our pivot table, we're going to go to insert, pivot table, and our select source box pops up. What this box allows us to do is tell the pivot table where is the data housed. Now we have the ability to do data source registered in calc. That's a little bit more involved, so I'm probably going to do another tutorial on that one. But in this tutorial, we're going to look at named range and current selection. Now if you notice, current selection is what it defaults to, and everything within the data set is selected for us automatically. And current selection is probably what you're going to use most of the time. But we also have the ability to do a named range or another worksheet within the workbook, and we will go over that a little bit later. So with current selection selected, we're going to tell it OK. And this is our pivot table layout. This is where we're going to define filters, rows, columns, and values. For filters, I'm going to use item description and location. So I'm going to go over to my available fields and I'm going to drag and drop item description and location. And this will give me a drop down at the top of my pivot table that will allow me to choose from certain item descriptions to see where all those were sold or to choose a specific location and see everything that they sold. For row fields, what rows do we want the pivot table to display? In this case, I want it to display customer name and customer ID. So back in my available fields, I'm going to grab customer name and drop it, and customer ID. For the data fields, we need to tell the pivot table what values do we want you to return. Well, in this case, I want the quantity and the amount. So over in my available fields, we're going to pull quantity and we're going to pull amount. Now, if you notice, this says some quantity and some amount. And some means it's going to add. So, for example, if I pick an item description of apples and I leave the location of all, in the rows it's going to give me the customer name, the customer ID, and then it's going to add up their entire quantity and their entire amount sold for apples. Our column fields default to data. And what that means is it's automatically going to add these data fields. So you will have a column for some quantity and some amount. Our row fields will also have a column header as well. If there's any other fields you want to add a column for, just go to your available fields, grab it, and drop it. Now if you're looking in your layout, and let's just say you're looking at your filters, and you say, I need location before item description, you can just grab it and rearrange them. And this applies to any of your pivot table layout fields, your rows, data, or your column fields. Down in options, you'll notice total columns and total rows is automatically checked. I would leave those checked. That means anything that you sum will be added across and down. So I would leave those as is. Ignore empty rows. I do not check this in the options because there can be something going on in your data set that can cause an empty row that's actually an error. So to make sure that your data set is accurate, I would leave this unchecked, but play with it and it is completely up to you. I don't really use identify categories or add filter, but I do always check enable drill to details. 
And what this will allow us to do is go to our data fields and double click on some quantity or some amount and it'll give us the details that added up to these data fields. Under source and destination, you'll notice selection is automatically there. And that's because at the beginning when we were setting up our pivot table, we told it current selection. And we'll go over named range a little bit further when we cover that in this tutorial. For our destination, we have the ability to do a selection and tell it to put the pivot table within the same worksheet. I don't like to do that because I tend to use charts and it can get kind of crowded when you have your raw data, your pivot table, and a chart. So I don't tend to use it within the same worksheet. Again, we'll go over named range a little bit later. I usually use new sheet. Now one thing to keep in mind is when you use new sheet, you do not have any input as to what it names it when it creates the new sheet for the, for the pivot table. However, you can change that name down the road. So with new sheet selected, let's tell it OK. And this is our pivot table. If you notice in the new tab, it named it pivot table underscore sales data underscore one. And you can rename this if you want. I generally don't, but that's completely up to you. I'm going to do a little bit of formatting to make sure that everything is visible. If you notice, this says amount USD, but this isn't in a format of currency. So we can also format that just like we would formatting any other information. So now we have our item description and a drop down for our filter. We have location and a drop down for our filter. We have our customer name and a drop down, customer ID and a drop down, and then we have our sum quantity and sum amount. If you remember when we set it up, we told it to total the columns and total the rows. Down at the bottom, you'll see total result and it summed everything for your quantity and your amount. So let's look a little bit at how the pivot table works. If we go to item description, right now it says all. If we uncheck all and we tell it apples, tell it okay, and it shows us all of our customers, their IDs, the number they sold, and the amount of sales it totaled up to. Now if we change our location, let's change it from all and go to Germany, it'll show us that these customers sold this amount for this amount of sales in Germany. When we set up our pivot table, we checked that we wanted to be able to drill the details. Now what this allows us to do is either double click on say some quantity or some amount and see what the details are that added up to those amounts. And if you notice, your headers are exactly the same as what we see in our raw data set. It creates a new sheet at the bottom with this data in it so that we can very easily toggle back and forth between our pivot table and our details. So this data is static. Now what I mean by that is if you add a row like I did on the original data, it's not going to reflect in your pivot table even if you refresh it. I added Greenland, Ivan, and if we go over to our pivot table, right click, refresh, that does not show up here. So only use this for static data. We're going to go over the named range, which can be used for dynamic data. If you want to make changes to your pivot table from somewhere within it, right click, go to properties, and our pivot table layout box comes up. This is where you can make any changes to filters, rows, your options, your source and destination and even in your data fields. Let's say that you decide that instead of doing a sum, you want to average the quantity and the amount. If you double click, your data field box pops up and you have a list of functions. You can do sum, count, average, and so on. Let's look at how to create a chart for our pivot table. From anywhere in our pivot table, go to insert and chart. And if you notice the way that it's coming up right now, our chart type and our chart elements are all we can change. If we go to next, we can give it a title, but if we go to finish and we look at this, this is a mess because it is pulling both the name, customer name and customer ID, and it's making it really difficult to read. So I'm going to get rid of this chart. 
If I try to delete the chart, I'm going to get an error, and that's okay. Just click back into your pivot table and then delete the chart. Now you could go in and delete this customer name and that would be fine. You could do that from within your pivot table properties. Go in here and do customer name and remove it. Or if you create your chart outside of the pivot table, so click on a cell outside and go to insert chart. You'll notice that you have the ability to change the data range and the data series. So a column chart is fine here. So I'm going to tell it next. Now, if you notice, the data range has A4, and A4 includes our customer name. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this A to AB, and that's going to exclude our customer name. And then if you notice, it's also including D35, which is our total results. And I don't want that in there either. So I'm going to tell it to stop with D34. So I'm going to change this 35 to a 34. And data series and columns is fine. First row is a label. This is all fine. Go to next. All of this looks good. I'm going to give it a title of annual sales 2022. Our display legend looks fine, display grids look fine, and I'm going to tell it to finish. And that looks better. So I'm going to go ahead and move it. And you can make it as big as you want to see all of your numbers. Now, if you remember, I told you I did not like to do this on the same worksheet when I did a pivot table because my charts are always humongous. And this is a good example. So this looks a little crowded to me. So I'm going to go in on my X axis and I'm going to right click and I'm going to format the axis and I'm just going to go into my label and I'm going to change my text orientation just to give it a little bit of an angle and tell it OK. And that looks easier to read. And then you can use this chart in a presentation or anywhere else you need to and you should be good to go. Now let's look and see how we use named ranges in a pivot table. So we're going to use the same sales data, but if you notice, I do not have any kind of header or title. If you have that in the top there and you try to use a named range, it'll make it kind of funky. So I just leave it out. So using a named range in a pivot table comes in really handy if you're going to have dynamic data. Now what I mean by that is you're going to be adding columns or rows to your original data set. So the first thing we want to do is highlight all of our columns. And if you notice, it already has a name up here in this name box of annual sales 2022. You can name yours whatever you need to, but do not use spaces or characters. If you do, you'll get an error and it just won't work. Now from here, the process is mostly the same. We're going to go to insert pivot table. And instead of current selection, we're going to do our named range. And if you notice annual sales 2022 is in there. If you have more than one named range sheet or set of data, then it will reflect and you will have a list. And we're going to tell it OK. This is the same. So I'm going to go ahead and add our filters, rows, data and columns. Our options are going to be the same, so I'm going to leave the rest of these unchecked except for enable drill to details. And our source and destination is going to be a named range and it's called annual sales 2022 or what we named it up here at the beginning. And even though I still have the options of named range and selection, I'm going to a new sheet because you saw the size of my chart. <laughs> so go ahead and tell it OK. So it created our pivot table just like it did with current selection and it looks the same with one exception. If you notice in line 35, it says empty. If you go back to your sales data, because anything past line 202 is empty, that's why it's seeing the empty rows. So within our pivot table, this is an instance. We want to right click, go to properties, and we want to tell it in our options to ignore empty rows. And now it's gone. Other than that, it works exactly the same. We have our item description drop down, our location, customer name, some quantity. The properties work the same. Go back in and change them. 
everything else is the same. So let's go ahead and make a chart for our pivot table and it's going to work exactly the same. Click outside of your pivot table, go to insert chart, a column chart will work and we're going to go ahead and change this because it's including our customer name and our last line. So we're going to make this a B and we're going to make this 35. Tell it next. All of this looks okay. Next. And I'm going to give it a title of Annual Sales 2022. And we're going to tell it to finish. And it looks exactly the same. Now, this is still a little bit crowded, so I'm going to go to my X axis and I'm going to format it and give my text orientation just a little bit of an angle. Tell it okay. And that looks a whole lot better. So just keep in mind that current selection is for static data sets that are not going to change as far as rows and columns go. A named range is for dynamic data sets where you may be adding columns and rows. And now you can take your charts from either one and your data and share it in a presentation or however you need to. And that's it for today. If you found this video helpful, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. Drop me a comment if you have any questions, feedback, or ideas for future tutorials. And be sure to click that subscribe button before you leave. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.